brought to you by Smart Dog Productions. That's our dog, Beaumont, who's our therapy dog. And today we're going to talk about CT, myocardial perfusion imaging, CT, MPI. So we've not talked about that ever, ever before, but it is a very a dynamic, strong presence uh, in a lot of places and uh, in terms of pushing the envelope and in terms of new developments and new software and uh, new hardware. And so let's go to the European Congress of Radiology uh, with their special focus session on cardiac CT, cutting edge techniques, and see what they have to say about that. Well, they say that these are the three cutting edge techniques that they're talking about. And we've talked about the estimation of coronary flow reserve by CT. Uh, we've talked about FFR, and this is CFR. This is similar. This is what Dr. Gould does uh, with PET scanning. And uh, so this is somewhat similar to FFR. So uh, we've talked about that quite a few times. We've talked about the development of something we call the poor man's FFR. And then we have the development of uh, FFR by heart flow, which is a special technique with a supercomputer where we actually have to send off our images to Palo Alto to a supercomputer for development and then we get the information dropped in the web for us and we go to the cloud, pick it up and take a look at it. And so, so we've done a lot of this and we've done a lot of this. Plaque imaging with cardiac CT coming of age. So you've seen a lot of this and uh, we continue to push this into a new frontier. Uh, and our most recent interest has been in materials in terms of their strength and trying to figure out what's happening with the top of the plaque uh, that makes it rupturable. So, but we haven't talked about this topic here, which is myocardial perfusion imaging and clinical routine ready for prime time. So maybe we didn't think it was ready for prime time, but these folks do. So let's give this com com some consideration today and uh, see what you think about it. So my first encounter with this was resting CT myocardial perfusion in patients with possible acute coronary syndrome. And it looks like that was May 2013 in a radiology journal. And uh, there was a small study, and uh, they had only six patients of the whole group who had acute, actually nine, who had acute coronary syndromes. And of those nine, they had uh, three that were positive for resting CT myocardial perfusion. And then they had a whole bunch of artifacts, which they learned how to read around the artifact. And so they were only able to get a sensitivity of 33%. That's three out of nine that they were able to detect had decreased myocardial perfusion. And on the other hand, of uh, the other patients, they found that about 88% had some kind of artifact. So it looks like we have to study this. And this must be early in the development because things go so fast nowadays. And so early in development would be 2013. Wow. And late in the development is 2016. That's pretty exponential. So let's go look at this and see what we can say about that. Well, they said finally they were able to say CT MPI perfusion was normal in all 96 patients without ACS. And that's when they learned how to read around the artifacts produced by beam hardening and phase artifacts from movement of the patient through the scanner. However, no patient had true CT MPI, hypoperfusion defect, read as normal perfusion because of artifact. So, hmm, that's interesting. So that means, again, we have to read around the artifacts. Well, that's the big problem with spec scanning. We've got breast artifacts of the anterior wall and the apex. We've got stomach artifacts of the inferior wall. And so, hmm, sounds like this is not really an improvement. But this is early in the development, three years ago. So let's move on and see what happened and what else they could find out. So, well, it moved on. It moved on from just doing a rest study, just doing rest, CT, myocardial perfusion, and a single image. It moved on to 
something called dynamic myocardial perfusion study where they would do a stress and then would do a rest and it was time there was some time when you would actually make a film over a period of time uh, for maybe 30 seconds of imaging uh, and perhaps 40 millisieverts of radiation but again remember we're talking about early development and what would you think the development would be now well we're down to 10 millisieverts of radiation which I'll type in for you here 10 millisieverts of radiation uh, with the uh, dynamic scanning and with stress rest and with rest alone we're down to 5 millisieverts of radiation and so we can put that after the rest alone 5 millisieverts sieverts of radiation so no more 40 no more 40 40 has gone and uh, 40 looks pretty hazardous to me I don't think anybody would accept 40 but it looks like we can accept 10 you know so that looks doable and it looks like and let's highlight that in a different color and it looks like we can accept 5 at rest so then uh, it's not not a big deal of doubling from uh, 5 to 10, that doesn't seem like a really big deal. So, uh, but maybe, maybe, maybe you only want 5. So let's look at Vital Images, which is the software that we're exhibiting here and that we use for our transmissions. Basically, Vital Images released the first FDA-approved third-party software to evaluate CT myocardial perfusion from any CT systems data sets. Well, we happen to have that. And it's been around for five years. Where have I been? Well, I guess I just got an updated version, and I'm able to look at that now where I couldn't do it before. So that's why we haven't explored this before. We didn't have the software. But the software has been around for five years. So I'm not sure why I just have that now. Uh, because we like to push the edge here. So we've got it five years late. That's humongous in terms of development of concepts and ideas to be five years behind. So, sorry, even if CT perfusion is proven to be accurate as nuclear perfusion imaging, heaven, you know, forbid that anybody would consider nuclear perfusion accurate unless you're talking about perhaps uh, one thing only and that would be PET because we're certainly not talking about SPEC. So let's put that in here too. Let's put, let's put some parentheses and let's put uh, not spec, not spec, S P E C T, and let's put comma, and then let's put only pet, P E T, and uh, divide that so it's not together, and let's put a parentheses on the other side and close the parentheses, and it says okay, uh, it says. Uh, to be as accurate, proven to be as accurate. Well, I hope not. Not spec, only pet. Reimbursement may stall widespread acceptance. Well, reimbursement has stalled everything. Never before in the history of cardiac imaging have we had to stall out all new development because the insurance companies won't approve of PET, CT or MRI, and if they deny them, they save money. So. It used to be that technology moved ahead very rapidly in terms of clinical application. That's no longer so. And we're only behind 10 years in clinical application of CT, PET, and MRI because of the insurance companies and because of Medicare denial. So let's go on. The sensitivity of CT perfusion has been near 100%. Wow. And it has a high negative predictive value. The negative predictive value is probably what's important here and uh, the negative predictive value of somebody who has a bunch of calcium in a coronary CT uh, that's so totally opaque has been the Achilles heel in terms of cardiac CT interpretation and we overinterpret that and when we do a cardiac cath it turns out this to be a little streak of calcium it doesn't turn out to be an iceberg of calcium and uh, so we've got blooming artifact in the calcification. We're trying to eliminate it with dual scanner where you subtract the calcium out, trying all kinds of things to read around the calcium. But this would give us an opportunity to read around the calcium 
by saying that the perfusion distal to the calcified lesion is normal. So that's a pretty significant development because that is our Achilles heel. So 2016 headline radiology to get day, go with the flow, CT micro to perfusion imaging is gaining momentum. So that just means a lot of people are doing it and writing about it and uh, we put a lot of resources into this in terms of new scan development and new software development. So is it worth it? Let's see. We have to do two studies. We have to review the CT and hold the patient to see if myocardial perfusion CT is needed. So first they do a regular CT to look at anatomy and then if the anatomy is normal they say go home because you can't really justify doing the stress first because then that's presuming we're going to do another test to look at the anatomy. We're just, we can't look at the perfusion first with stress and then look at the rest. So let's, let, we'll talk about that some more and the other thing has been a lot of contrast, 140 cc's when we're using 85 cc's. The most we use is 100 cc's. That's that's 40 percent more, maybe 80 60 60 percent more, sometimes 40 percent more, depending upon what you're using. And so that's significant too. And so we're concerned about that. So let's go on and see what this kind of imaging looks like. Let's compare it to spec, or let's compare it to PET. So a common comparison would be looking at specs because we're used to looking at them. Doesn't mean that they're any good. 40% false positive, 65% false negative, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, you know, you know the drill, 47 studies, sorry, uh, 47 centers. So let's take a look over here and here we are. We have a rest stress imaging. So that's good because that means that they did a rest CT study first and looked at the anatomy and they must have found something in the LED and I'm not sure if they knew if it's just a big hunk of calcium, a big chunk, uh, uh, sometimes they call it a, a sheet of calcium, if it was that uh, or you know if it was a, a bona fide lesion in the LED that looks severe. So but you can see looking at this image that there is probably a homogeneous distribution of contrast which is iodine. We're going to measure iodine in here in this wall because we're saying that myocardial perfusion by iodine uh, becomes such that there's iodine in the wall and it becomes more and more intense as the contrast comes in the bolus and that there's iodine that washes out and there must be a peak and the peak may last 15 or 20 seconds. So, and it depends on whether we're using some kind of stress thing, like adenosine, which may change the washout time. Also may change the time going in. And patients are usually on beta blockers because we want a slow heart rate. Well, beta blocker is going to change things too. And the beta blocker protects the myocardium from ischemia. The heart rate's going to be slow. That means there's going to be slower introduction of iodine with this bolus and slower uptake. And then we've got nitroglycerin. And nitroglycerin is to vasodilate the arteries so they look beautiful. But on the other hand, the nitroglycerin may be myocardial protective. And if there's a lesion that subtends this myocardium, perhaps there's less iodine in it because of nitroglycerin. I don't know. And so we're not talking about ischemia, we're talking about the presence or absence of iodine, you know, subtending a blockage that we want to know if it's significant. So realize that we're not talking about ischemia. I never see people, you know, who are getting coronary CT. We don't usually see them having angina. I've seen one. And so they don't usually have angina because they're beta blocked and they get nitroglycerin. So we're not going to be talking about ischemia. We're just going to be talking about the presence of iodine in this wall. So there's a volume curve that takes place and there's time. And so over time, vessel CT, Hounsfield units is going to change and tissue CT, Hounsfield units is going to change and we can probably track that 
and the tracking is going to be that the vessel CT is going to change over time and we're going to get contrast in it and the contrast must be going up like this and this must be the vessel because that's going to be the first one that gets a contrast and then it's going to be extracted by the myocardium and it's going to go up like that and that's the extraction and then it's going to somewhat uh, wash out of the myocardium somehow wash out of the vessels and so we're going to see time curves taking place and this is obviously is going to be the vessel CT and one or two of these are going to be the tissue and uh, there looks like a delay in this one being taken up by tissue so one is going to be the rest and one is going to be uh, the stress and so perhaps this is the stress and then increased coronary blood flow perhaps this is the rest okay and so then we have an image and let's look at this image that's pretty dramatic and you can see it from across the room and you don't even have to color code it because the contrast is by this definition of what we're using here uh, we've coded it so that the contrast uh, makes this look lighter and the contrast so that's normal perfusion and you can imagine this on a spec scan and the wall as we described it at rest looks exactly the same as the rest image which is very dark which means it didn't get contrast in it to give it more Hounsfield units and there's almost a clear demarcation here of an LED that supplies the septum the anterior wall the apex and a little bit of the anterior lateral wall which would be the diagonal vessel so this would be like an LAD with a lesion prior to the di first diagonal and uh, prior to the septal perforators so it's a high-grade LAD proximal lesion and so perhaps that's what we're describing here and here is the LAD there's the LAD and there's contrast in the LAD over here there's the LAD there's the right coronary down here and this is the circumflex so clear identification of the coronaries doesn't seem to be any attenuation of contrast in the LED producing this study so very interesting so let's go on and see so now you see what what the idea is this is the whole concept and you could do this say just at rest and uh, with the contrast in this is a rest with contrast in and I don't know if we can distinguish any differences here because they're they might be more subtle and so but I look over here and this does seem to be lighter than this and I look over here and this is lighter than this and then it starts blending over here and then this gets darker as if it doesn't have as much contrast and there's no reason to suspect that the lateral wall would be um, imaged better you know there's no uh, no reason to suspect that and so it looks to me like we can see the same thing over here but the differential between the normally perfused tissue with iodine content and the abnormal perfusion tissue with iodine content it just doesn't have as much of a delta and so but you can color code this and you can make normal tissue bright red and you can make perfusion normal perfusion bright red and under perfusion you know blue or something and this would stand out this would stand out so I'm thinking that this lesion is so significant that after a beta blocker and after nitroglycerin and injection of contrast at rest without stress that we can tell that there's decreased perfusion in the septum that means decreased iodine not ischemia decreased iodine in the septum anterior wall and the anterior lateral wall and look you can see this clear demarcation that you saw before and the demarcation over here is a little fuzzier it's more of a blend I can see this that certainly looks a lot a lot lighter and has more iodine in it but I can't see right up in there and so I can't tell about that uh, and in terms of you can see that there's a different timing on this one because this one still has contrast in the right ventricle contrast in the coronaries this one has contrast in the coronaries too there's no more contrast in the right ventricle so this must be a timed thing that was later in the timing than this one so if this one 
was a time curve like this and it peaked like that, then we still had, certainly up here we're getting near the peak, we still had, when it was peaking in the myocardium, we, it was peaking so fast that we still had contrast in the right ventricle. Whereas here, I guess they were waiting for a later peak or they were getting some early washout and so there's no contrast in the right ventricle anymore. So studying this particular slide is very important because this slide tells the whole ball game. It tells, well, this is a rest study and that's what that looks like. And it looks like you can tell there's an LED lesion on the rest study. This is a stress study that exaggerates it a lot and you can tell from across the room, but we don't need, we can tell subtle, we can read subtle stuff, because look, there was a price we paid. We, we did two images. This is a second total set of images, and so we doubled the radiation exposure. Maybe even more if we did this time curve, because the time curve means that we made dynamic images and made a whole series of maybe 30 seconds or 20 seconds of images, and then plotted the curve across here. So to get this dynamic thing, we could have spent a lot of radiation. So this was early on when it was 40 millisieverts. And so, and then we're comparing stress and rest. So we got rest, stress, rest came first, dynamic study. And so this is the most radiation and uh, we, we can tell without it. So let's go over here and say, what else can we tell? Well, this is sort of classical stuff and we can eliminate that up there. This is the kind of clinical stuff that you see all the time, and it tells you what you're looking at normally. And so we got stress, we've got rest, we got delayed acquisition, and then we got interpretation. And so if there there's a defect, and if it's there at stress, and if it's there at rest, you know, then that means it's a fixed defect, which means it can probably be an infarct. And then if we have normal rest, and then we get a stress defect, uh, then that says uh, that's reversible, and so that's ischemia, supposedly, on uh, spec scanning or PET scanning, and then delayed acquisition, and we might see something different happen where it's still there, and so that would sometimes maybe 15% of uh, ischemia uh, actually can uh, be persistent for a while and we'll see a defect that hangs in there for a while. So if you wait a while and there, it's, still, uh, it's still there, then uh, it's not ischemia, it's an infarct. And so that's basically what that's saying. Let's look at this in terms of color coding images and again comparing to classical old time spec scanning. So we'll take this first set of images and take a look at that. So the first set of images um, basically is a great place to start because it looks like we're starting with uh, an area that's gone in the anterior wall. That looks like very much like the picture we were looking at over here. So we're dealing with LAD. So let's go back over here because LAD occupies a lot of territory. And so we like to deal with LAD uh, because it's kind of interesting um, because of the Widowmaker and the amount of territory that's involved. And so we see in the spec scan uh, basically a fixed defect involving the same area, the septum, the anterior wall, the anterior lateral wall. So that would imply LAD prior to septal perforator and prior to the diagonal vessel. And then we come over here, we see the same thing. So that would imply that it's probably infarcted. Both stress and rest, we see the same thing. Well, this is a color-coded myocardial perfusion study. And this is the rest study that shows decrease, it's color-coded, so iodine is color-coded yellow and green. And it looks like, just like the other image that we looked at, there's more iodine in, seen here in the lateral wall for some reason compared with the inferior wall and septum. Well, that's identical because there was more iodine seen in this lighter area than it was down in the inferior wall and up in here. And of course, this was subtending the area of very little iodine. Doesn't look like it's infarcted because even though it looks like decreased counts, this one doesn't look infarcted because there's no thinning of the muscle. There's no scar tissue. There's no fatty 
infiltration or replacement, and then very late you can get calcification in some. So let's go back over here and say, okay, let's look at this. The wall does have normal thickness, and so this is not a late infarct. You know, I can't say if there's fatty infiltration because I can't see the image without iodine in it. And so, uh, but I can say uh, that there's decreased perfusion. Well, let's say the decreased iodine in here. Decreased iodine in here, and again, decreased iodine in here, and it's valid for rest. And so we said, oh, must be an LAD lesion. And it's valid for stress. Oh, must be an LAD lesion. And then we're at the margin of it. We really got a lot of iodine in here after whatever they did to stress the patient, probably a denison. The problem with using an agent was if you use Lexiscan, you'll get a heart rate that increases about 21 beats per minute on the average. If you use Persantin, you get a heart rate that increases about 5 beats per minute. If you use Dobutamine, oh my gosh, the heart rate will go up to 150 or 180. And then if you use a denison, the heart rate goes up too. But nobody uses a denison much anymore except in the cath lab when they're doing FFR. And so this is probably Lexiscan, and we probably did get a jump in the heart rate. So that has to be countered. So the patient is probably on a beta blocker to prevent that, and probably very adequately beta blocked. Because uh, we give nitroglycerin all the time. There should be a reflex tachycardia. That's how you know that the nitroglycerin got in the system. And there's not because of the profound beta blockade that we have on our patients that we send for a CTA. We usually have them in the 50s. So we, we'll, we'll certainly figure that the heart rate didn't go up uh, with the nitroglycerin because they're beta blocked. And it probably didn't go up with a denison or Lexiscan either. And so, so we got a good image without motion artifact. And so that looks good. So this looks like that's a defect, that's a defect, that's a defect, that's a defect. Here's the LED totally occluded. And it uh, looks like we've got a fixed defect, so there must be some scar tissue in there. Uh, some amount of scar tissue. We don't see the LAD retrograde filling from the right. We don't see the LAD filling from collaterals. I can't see it very well. And so uh, it looks like there's some defect. It hasn't scarred down yet, so I don't know the date of the infarction. Let's go over here and take a look. So this is an, supposed to be showing us an infarct of some unknown age. So let's go over here and look at this. And uh, this, again, is a spec scan on the right-hand side, and uh, you see the lateral wall, very nice and bright, and you see the septum, not as bright, not as close to the camera uh, as the lateral wall. Septum's more deep inside, and so the lateral wall is going to be brighter uh, than the septum. So then we see the septum, and then we see the septum disappear. Same patient. Hey, it's anterior wall, septal, distribution of the diagonal probably in here, so it's probably prior to the septal periphery and diagonal vessel. And so we're trying to show, hey, that's what happens. Well, let's go show the same thing with myocardial perfusion imaging with, again, rest and stress, two sets of images. I don't know if it's dynamic. I just see a static image here and a static image here. So I can't tell you if you did a bunch of frames. All I can tell you is here's a static image, here's a static image. We had at least two, and we've gotten this down to five and five millisieverts, giving us ten with new technology for what that's worth. So we can't poo-poo it and say, oh, too much radiation. So here's the rest image. And color coding iodine uh, makes this very bright. It looks like this was a rest study that was done in a phase that's still giving some subendocardial increased perfusion. And uh, then, because red in, in the spectrum is much uh, more brighter, and so it means more iodine. So we got iodine in here, iodine in here. And in this particular case, we uh, don't have a lot of decreased iodine in this area. We just have increased iodine around here. Maybe if uh, green gets to yellow and yellow gets to red, then this green is probably decreased iodine. So the rest study is showing us compared to the lateral wall, that the septum has less blood at rest. Uh, and it's not the same as looking over here, because this is radiation coming from the target organ itself, giving out gamma rays from technetium or from thallium, whereas this 
is radiation that's passing through the heart from an external source uh, that is basically producing a shadow, which is the iodine. And so here's the shadow of the iodine. So we have to say that this uh, has decreased perfusion compared with this. So we've already found the LED um, defect on the rest image after beta blocker and nitroglycerin and then compounded by giving the patient a denison we get you know no more subtle images we've got hit you in the face with lateral wall full of iodine and then we've got whoops the septum enter your wall enter lateral wall couldn't keep up with getting the same amount of iodine after a denison and after another bolus of contrast and so, hey, this one slaps you in the face like this one does. Uh, this has increased counts on the lateral wall because of the technique and the lateral wall giving out gamma rays and being closer to the camera and this giving out gamma rays and being further and deeper inside the body. But that's not the same for this. Uh, so we can't say that this is because of an artifact, we have to say this is real. There's less iodine in this wall compared with this wall. So this is we're looking for ischemia over here, and we're looking for uptake of an isotope and a metabolic process. Over here, we're looking for a passive uptake of iodine subtending a blocked artery. And with collaterals, maybe, but we don't see any. Okay. So I think we understand that. So let's go on to the next. And as we build this database, we're building a database for rest, stress, CT, for rest CT, for stress CT, for stress and rest CT, for dynamic, where we make a bunch of M series of images and we're able to plot this point, or for static, where we have only one point, that point and that point. And so, so we have lots of choices. And then we got protocols. Static is a single data set of the myocardium, which is acquired after injection of a pharmacological stressor, so that would be stress as opposed to rest, during first pass contrast enhancement. And then a second set is acquired at rest. This would be stress, rest. So this is presuming that there's a blockage already because we're doing the stress test first. And so if we did the rest first and didn't have any coronary disease, then we wouldn't have to do the stress. So we may be doing stress unnecessarily on a group of patients, but we do the stress first because if we did the rest, we'd already have some iodine in there and we have to wait 20 minutes to get rid of it. And so this was done to speed up the process. So just keep that in mind, but we keep in mind also that of the most of the patients you're seeing, so many of them have either normal coronaries and that's why they're getting the CT. So they don't go to the cath lab with 60% normal coronary rate. So they have either normal coronaries or they got some little pieces of focal calcification that are not obstructing and decreasing blood flow. And so that means that a lot of people are going to get stress rest who don't need it. So we got to keep that in mind in terms of doubling the radiation in these people and uh, doubling the contrast. So let's look to see what is the dynamic and dynamic CT perfusion imaging Multiple sets of myocardial attenuation were acquired. So we got 30 or 40 seconds. We're building that curve after the contrast injection. Stationary or shuttle mode can be applied to repeat scanning. A big advantage of the dynamic imaging is that the myocardial blood flow and myocardial blood volume can be quantified. Okay, so what does that say? That means that we are constructing this curve and can use this curve in PET scanning to tell you myocardial blood flow, or at rest we get myocardial flow, and then we get stress, we get myocardial flow, and then we compare the two, and you got uh, basically fractional flow reserve. That's coronary fractional flow reserve, CFR. And so we're trying to do that over here because it's an absolute number, and we like to have the absolute numbers. But we have drag the radiation out for 30 or 40 seconds to get that, so it's a big sacrifice. A major drawback at dynamic CT perfusion techniques is the higher radiation dose. Higher radiation dose required because we're dragging it out. So we have to see, is there really an advantage to this? Are we getting 
Are we getting advantage of this over static study? Are we getting advantage as I showed you? I'm, I'm reading this at rest. I'm reading this over here and saying, oh, you know, looks to me like there's a, a, D, a LED. And so uh, I don't need that. So do we really need that? So let's go on and talk about it. Do we need stress rest dynamic imaging? We got the comparison of the stress to the rest to define infarct or ischemia. We got the comparison of the stress to rest defines artifacts, which are false positive. The peak is useful. Incoming, you know, I'm not plotting that curve for myocardial uh, perfusion. I'm not sure if I need myocardial blood flow. It's nice. It's like frosting on the cake. We're not used to it. I, I certainly like it when I send patients to Lance Gould for a PET scan because he's got the most sophisticated software in the world. Cost a hundred million dollars and 43 years of his life to put that together. So, he, but he's the father of myocardial blood flow, and you're not surprised. He's the man that said you have to get an 85% blockage before you get ischemia. So, incoming is not useful to me. The washout is not helpful. I don't think I need to have stress and rest. I don't think I need dynamic images. Perhaps if we use CTMRI to rule out false positive CTAs with heavily calcified vessels, we don't have to worry about artifacts because we're not, we're looking for negatives. We're looking for negatives. Of course, artifacts might produce positives when they're supposed to be negatives, and so we'll have to think about that. If we want to use CT to confirm CTA severe stenosis, we need to understand, control, and eliminate the CT MPI artifacts that were cited in the original article that we talked about. This is the original article, and it's 88% of cases had an artifact. And so I'm concerned about that. May we have to worry about artifacts, because if we get if we use CT to rule out false positive, that means a big hunk of heavy calcium, and we get some artifacts distal to the LED on the wall, the anterior wall, and the septum, we would have to worry about that. So let's get rid of that. It looks to me like we have to worry about, we do have to worry about artifacts, okay? Creating a, uh, a false sense of that there's a severe proximal lesion in that hunk of calcium proximally. So we do have, so artifacts are important. We can't get around them. And there are a lot of them, apparently. So let's go figure out what that's all about. Well, let's talk about if we did single static first pass rest only, you know, will that help us? Can this get us where we want to be if we understand the artifacts, can this do it? And so I'm going to make that a little brighter here because it looks to me like that could do it. So maybe we moved on too fast with new hardware and new software and dynamic and dual head uh, and uh, tracking the bolus uh, and getting data points. Maybe we moved too fast on that. Maybe we were okay where we were to start with, and we had a pretty good idea because we don't need new software. We don't need new hardware. All we need is the basic from 2013, and we just the basic scanners that we bought, 64 slice scanners, 10 years ago, and then added radiation reduction to them by iterative reconstruction and model-based iterative reconstruction. So maybe if that's that may be an important phase. And so let's say these things may be true. So let's go look and study this and talk about it. So we can talk about artifact. Let's skip that and we'll get back to artifact. Let's look at a gentleman, Osawa, obviously Japanese, who says additional diagnostic value of first pass myocardial perfusion imaging without stress when combined with 64 row detector coronary CT angiography in patients with cast estimated coronary artery disease. Okay, so that's looking at the coronaries and saying, yep, looks like a bad lesion, totally occluded or looks like a 90%. And we know that doesn't work because of FFR, but, uh, but let's, let's do it anyway. Let's compare it and see. So this is what we were talking about. This is just a rest study. This is 2014, so 
This was when uh, REST studies were pretty popular uh, after 2013. So it was early technology, and this is what they did. And they compared it with coronary disease, and they got some pretty good numbers. These look like pretty good numbers to me. And uh, it looks like that uh, it was very useful in identifying segments that couldn't be evaluated because of severe calcification or motor motion artifacts. And we were just looking uh, distal to the chunk of calcium to see where the perfusion was. And the perfusion was normal. And we said, oh, that's fine. We don't have to worry about it. And so, of course, if that perfusion normality uh, is is just isn't isn't worth it, and if, if the perfusion normality is uh, actually underestimating, uh, we have a problem. But they said it looks okay, and they compared them and found that if you had eyeball severe stenosis, it correlated with decreased perfusion of that area on the CT. So let's see what happened in 2016. Well, all the new technology, everything else advanced everywhere except this group, Asawa. Asawa said, we're still doing first pass. We're still doing rest only without stress, and we're not doing dynamic. We don't want to give 140 cc's of contrast. We don't want to do two studies. We don't want to do stress first on people who are going to be normal. We don't want any of that, but we're going to compare something different. This time, instead of comparing to eyeball cath, we're going to the gold standard from FAME 1 and FAME 2. And so what we're going to compare is we're going to compare FFR, invasive FFR. Oh, okay, well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's see what happened with that. Well, first pass CT without stress, correctly reclassified, 38% of CCTA false positive vessels as true negative. So what is that saying? Well, that's saying that you see a chunk of calcium in the vessel uh, and uh, it's completely opacified. Some people will read that as severe disease, even though there's blooming artifact and beam hardening and all this other stuff. Some people will, they don't want to have an act of omission so they'll call it severe disease. You do a cath and you'll see just a streak of calcium in it. You'll say, ah, you know, CT scans aren't very good. Well, also some other people like me will look at it and say, well, it's a big chunk of calcium in there. It's a pacifier. I can't see in and I'm not calling it. Okay, I'm not calling. I'm just going to say neutral, can't see in this vessel and go on and look for something else down in the vessel that I can really read and call. So that may be an act of omission, but I'm going to be right a lot of the time because most of the time what we think is an iceberg of calcium is just a tiny little streak when you see the cardiac cath. And so, but these guys said, hey, instead of an act of commission and overcalling, instead of an act of omission and undercalling, you know, why don't we use the CT MPI, which is right there. All we have to do is take that image and put it in some software, which we've had since 2013, and see what it shows. And then compare that to invasive FFR. And they did, and they said, hey, we reclassified because of people who were the overreaders. We reclassified 38% of what we saw there. That's, that's pretty good. And those were on overreaders. Underreaders might get some reclassification too, you know, but may not be as much. So let's go look at some of these pictures and see if we like them and see what we can tell about it. So here's a good one. Here is a first pass resting only myocardial perfusion image CT in a calcified coronary. So, oh wow, I mean these are calcified coronaries. We're talking coronary calcification score of 4,000. So chunks, uh, sheets, uh, nodular, every kind of calcium there is in this particular vessel. Now you know that dense calcification is less associated with stenosis. That's a fact. Dense calcification less associated with stenosis. What else? Well, uh, 
calcification doesn't necessarily have to mean that there's vulnerable plaque in here. And I don't see any vulnerable plaque. So this is like, you know, one and done or done over a period of time, but there's nothing in there that seems to be blistering or smoldering. I don't see inflammatory disease. All right, so a lot of people say severe LAD, severe circumflex, severe right coronary artery disease, three vessel disease. Well, you know, wrong, because look at the cardiac cath. Where did the chunks of calcium go? They're gone. Oh, my goodness. Blooming artifact is alive and here to stay. There are some scanners that are actually subtracting the calcium when you have a dual head scanner. You can scan with radiation uh, from one camera KV and the other camera different KV and actually subtract the calcium. But we didn't do that. You know, we don't have that. And so, well, look, no coronary disease. We certainly look like fools when we say, severe multivessel disease and we see no coronary artery disease and we even have an FFR in the LAD that looks like that. It's just encrusted, encased in calcium with a normal lumen. And so the calcium is just opaquing, opacifying the vessel. So here's an FFR 0.86. Everybody will tell you, can't do an angioplasty on that. I don't see anything in the angioplasty. And so, well, let's look at our myocardial perfusion scan and just like we do with spec scans you know we make a pizza and then we put pepperonis on which are decreased blood flow and this pizza which is this is the apex this is moving away from the apex this is moving towards the base this is the base this is anterior this is lateral this is septal this is inferior and this would be called homogeneous because it doesn't meet criteria of two standard deviations what is this? This is the distribution of iodine in the heart muscle that's been color coded. And so, and the brighter images will tell you something and we'll look and see what the color coding message is. And let's go look at another study and we'll be able to understand the rainbow of color coding well. Well, let's see. It looks like blue is, is decreased iodine and bright is a lot of iodine, and orange is less iodine, but blue. So we don't see any blue here except on this rim, which just doesn't mean anything. So there's no blue. And this is uh, the most iodine, and the most iodine, the most iodine. Along the rim here, septal is the least iodine, and so normal. Well, that did help us, because we couldn't see inside the vessel. We don't see any, as long as it's stone cold normal. Was there a false negative? I don't know. There's no false positive. So let's go look over here and see an abnormal. Well, this looks like an abnormal because we've got blue. And we've got North America up here, and there we are. And we've got Central America and South America or something. And so let's look at this. Again, coronary calcium score of about 4,000. Sheets of calcification, glomming calcification, contiguous, continuous, a lot of calcium. So what does that mean in terms of this vessel? Well, if this is anterior uh, going towards the apex, if it's not an artifact, then it's decreased iodine in that section, which would be LAD, which would be somewhere apical, some were going all the way back to the base, so it would have to be up in here somewhere. And I can't see anything prior to the sheet of calcium. It doesn't involve the septal perforator, so it's after the septal perforator. So it would be in here somewhere where I can't see at all. So maybe it's a long lesion, and maybe the long lesion gives you a drop in FFR going down the lesion. That doesn't mean a stent's going to help you, because if there's no focal lesion, and you put a stent in, and the lesion is continuous atherosclerosis, there's going to be a drop in FFR that's going to be slowly, and there's going to be a gradient coming across the vessel, not a sudden drop. And so that may be the case here. Well, let's go over here and look at the anatomy. The anatomy shows, it looks like a lesion in that septal perforator, but not severe, because there's nothing happening in the septum. And then we're going down the LED, down, 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 
and then they've got the FFR. They haven't done the pullback. I guess they did the pullback across here, and there was a long gradient of decrease perfusion, but we still got an FFR of 0.78, and so 0.78 is a drop, but it's not severe. It's pretty close. It's above 0.75. It's not 0.80, but it's in the borderline zone. And then we've got a lesion over here in the right coronary. Let's see, where's the right coronary? Over here somewhere. We've got a lesion in the right coronary in this little bend. So this is going to be the little bend there. And there's uh, some lesion there. Not very impressive, but, uh, you know, again, we've got all this calcium upstream. And uh, I don't know if that lesion is significant, but we have decreased iodine in the inferior wall. Uh, inferior, sorry, going towards the apex, inferior wall, running the interventricular well, running running just underneath the inferior wall, posterior lateral more than anything. So it might be out here somewhere out here in the posterior lateral area. So, so this says that this is a problem, but it doesn't say that it's a problem that we need to fix. And so we don't know how the FFR drops across here. We can't, all we can see is this and this, and so the patient, it didn't help us, because the patient did have to go to the cath lab, and uh, the cath lab just showed this stuff, and it doesn't look like this is going to be something you're going to stent. Uh, I don't know, they don't tell you the FFR here, so I can't tell you if you're going to stent the right or not. doesn't look very impressive here, but maybe you'll stent the right, not stent that, because it's a gradient across there, and it didn't get very far down, so... Usually 0.78, you don't stent, and usually don't stent across a long area like that. So let's go to the next one and see if this one helps. Looks like the same. Uh, North America has gotten a little smaller. Central America has gotten shorter, and South America looks a little bigger. It looks like Australia in terms of shape. So going from there to there, we've got this appearance of decreased, so decreased iodine and decreased iodine. So then we go over here, and we see calcification. We go over here, we see the LED. Looks like it has a lesion there. And uh, basically go over here. There's a long area in the LED. It doesn't look too bad, but let's go over here and see what this looks like. And this says, oh, this says there's an LED apical lesion, and this says there's an inferior wall lesion. And so not sure what all that means, but let's go look at the FFR. And the FFR did show and did support an LAD lesion with a drop 0.75 and uh, did support also uh, something going on in the lateral wall which is this um, and so this is the circumflex and so this is defining two areas well I'm still not convinced and uh, when we talk again if time is up and when we talk again we're going to give you more information about this and we're going to talk about our own experience and so and how we've used this technology and where it's taken us. So I look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you very much for coming and uh, see you next week. Bye-bye.